everyone. Welcome. Thanks for being here. I was just locking the door the hopes that my children don't run in and interrupt us. Um, I see some chats already coming in. If you're just joining, please take a moment. We'd love to hear the answer to your question, how is math going in your home? Um, we've had a lot of kind of thoughts coming in already. In some places, it's going not so great. Patrice, we hear you. Um, Margarita is doing just fine, but is not sure, is not really confident that she's doing it the right way. Um, and so a lot of people are here for new tips um, and ready to learn. So thank you for coming. I am Stacey Gershkovich. I am the Managing Director of Sharing here at the Robertson Center. I'm a former math teacher. I'm a former principal, and I am a parent of three. So um, welcome. Thanks for coming. And I want to say that just you being here is probably a sign that you're doing the right thing. So take a deep breath. This is a hard time and recognize that most of what you're doing is probably good. Happy to give you some tips. I um, want to start with recognizing that everyone's realities are different in life, um, but particularly during this time. So just as I'm speaking, I want you to think about what applies here, what you can take with you. Um, don't feel like you need to take everything that I'm saying and start doing it tomorrow. The goal here is just to give you some thoughts, some ideas, and you should take what works for you uh, and leave the rest. I won't be offended. So with that said, um, I wanted to jump into, um, sorry, I'm just getting the technology started with me. Um, a little bit of a roadmap, what we're going to do today. So if you're joining us, you know that we're here to focus on math. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why math is different. Um, every other subject seems pretty similar to the way we learned when we were young, but math is very different. Why is that? Uh, we're going to talk about how you can support your child in an effective way. Um, and then we're going to get a chance to practice, right, because practice makes us better at what we do. So in a moment, uh, in a couple of minutes, actually, we're going to actually do some math together. No pressure. It's going to be fun. Um, so get excited. So with that said, I want to hear more from you. Um, we asked the question, how is math going in your home? But I would love for you to take a moment to put in that chat box, how do you feel when it's time to do math work at home? So not how is it going for your child, we'll talk about, about, about that, but how do you feel? Um, I should say, if you're not familiar, there's a chat box right in the middle of your screen. Um, I guess every screen looks a little different, but there should be a chat box, the event chat. Go ahead and type in how, it's, how you feel when it's time for math. Um, if you have any larger questions that don't apply right now, there is a Q&A box. Um, feel free to put those questions in there at the end um, of my session. We have plenty of time for a question and answer. We'll get to those. So um, question and answer is there, but event chat as well. Okay, so there it seems like there's a little bit of unsure, um, a little bit of confusion or maybe not feeling confident around math time. Um, Bernadette is feeling overwhelmed. Um, Erica finds it stressful, although I appreciate the smiley face. Um, having a little humor in this certainly helps. Um, so just think a moment about how you're feeling when it comes to be math time, right? Um, Felicia is feeling frustrated. Um, so a lot of different feelings, both on behalf of our children, um, but also on behalf of us. John is feeling overwhelmed when it's time for math. Um, some anxiety. Patricia, I appreciate your anxiety and your, your honesty. Um, you're feeling some anxiety, but also sometimes you feel a little stupid, right? Um, a lot of these comments, you see where a lot of us are feeling the same way. Sometimes people are stressed. They're not confident. Um, we're going to talk about all of this, um, but I thank you for those honest thoughts. So our goal here is really to, one, build our confidence about math time. I want you to think about the message that our children have been feeling from you or from the other people that surround them about math. Have they heard you say, I'm not a math person? Have they heard you say, I'm not good at math, or math is my least favorite subject, or um, I don't really know this, this is hard for me? Have they heard that uh, someone else in your family say that? Um, maybe some siblings, maybe some other family members. 
um, we got to change that, right? We don't really say to our children, well, I'm not good at reading um, or, you know, I don't really like um, exercise. Oh, maybe we do. But the <laughs> point is we are much more comfortable saying to our children, um, it is more societally uh, accepted in society to say, I'm not good at math. Um, and that message has an impact on our children. So one of the things I'm hoping that you walk away from today is really changing that uh, narrative in your household. And let's all become math people. We're all good at math. I know a lot of us have been cooking much more than we typically do. You're using math when you cook. Um, I, a lot of us are kind of buying food or different things online that we might have bought before in person, even when we're buying them in person. We are con constantly doing math to consider, does it make sense to buy the larger pack, how much cheaper it is, which uh, product is uh, more economical for me, et cetera, et cetera. So you are a math person. You do math every day. It might not be the same math that you learned in school, uh, but you are a math person. So reality check, this is hard. Um, this is a picture from my house um, at the end of a remote learning day. Uh, mathematics, uh, remote learning, everything about this right now is hard, even for myself, someone who obviously has some experience doing that. So we'll start there. We're all in this together, and it is all hard. Um, and it's not just me, right? You've seen these posts online. There's some great ones out there, but we've all seen it. We've all empathized with it. We've all said, yes, um, it's glad to see it's not me. We've seen parents, even before this, posting pictures of their child's homework, and we've looked at them and said, no, I don't understand either, right? Um, so we're all in this together. We've empathized, um, and we're going to change that, hopefully. We've longed for the good old days, right? Who's wanted this back? This looks familiar to me. I don't know if it makes much sense to me, but I know it. It's familiar. Um, and we're kind of lamenting why things had to change. So we're going to talk all about all of that today. So with that said, before we kind of launch into the math specifics, I wanted to talk a little bit about our goal of learning, right? Learning is not about getting the right answer. Certainly getting the right answer is part of learning, right? But learning really is about a process, particularly elementary school learning is not about just getting our kids to master some type of content, right? But it's really about setting our kids up to be lifelong learners. It's to be setting up that feeling that they have when they worked really hard at something and they eventually succeeded, right? The more times our children have that feeling, the more they're going to want that feeling and the more they're going to strive for that feeling moving forward. And so one of the things that we want you to think about is how much of the work that you're doing with your children is focusing on getting the right answer versus how much of the work that you're doing with your children is focusing on really getting them to show their best effort, really getting them to show what they're thinking, um, and certainly communicating that with your teachers. So just thinking about that balance in your home how much of it is really about trying to give your kid or lead your child to the right answer versus valuing where they are um, and valuing their type of uh, best effort wherever that lands them with the right answer or potentially not. So with that, I want to take a moment to reflect. One of the most important things that we know for children to be successful as they get older is setting up independence and work habits. Um, and we are now getting a larger look into our children's um, success with that with remote learning. So take a moment just to reflect, where is your child on the continuum of um, doing their work by themselves, right? Are you right now sitting with your child by their side as they complete all their work? right? That's kind of one end of the continuum. Or on the other end of the continuum, are you able to kind of tell your child to start their work and you don't see them for three hours? The end of the three hours, all their work is perfectly done, right? Or where are you in the continuum, right? I imagine a lot of us are somewhere in the middle and we might be in different places for different subjects. And certainly we might be in the different places for, with different children in our family. Uh, one of the kind of metaphors that we use with our um, parents is thinking about our focus in elementary school as the coach, right? When our child is in elementary school, 
we need to set up those work habits, right? Our child doesn't naturally understand that when it is time to do my work, it makes sense to have a clean space to do that in. My child doesn't naturally understand that doing my work kind of first thing in the morning makes sense because later in the day, I'm more tired and maybe less fresh and less able to focus. So when our child is in elementary school, our job is to be the coach, right? We tell our children when the practice is, we give them advice um, and give them the tools that they need and show them how it's done. Um, and we are there by their side cheering them on and celebrating when they do a great job. As our children get older, somewhere around the middle school age, and certainly this varies depending on child by child, um, our role shifts to be more of a manager. Right? When I am the manager, I give my children the assignment. I make sure they know what they need to do. Um, but I don't sit by their side as they do it. I check in with them along the way, and I certainly look at the end product um, to make sure it is meeting the expectations, give them feedback if they need to go back and revise, still celebrating um, and giving feedback. Given if I do all of that really well, the ultimate goal is that eventually our role shifts to be the consultant, right? Hopefully by sometime in high school, we are the consultant, Consultants are available, they're only a phone call away, but consultants are not showing up every day to check on how you're doing, right? Consultants are only there when you need them, and it is really up to your child to kind of reach out to say, hey, I need help with this. Um, so again, take a moment to reflect, where are you on this continuum currently? There's no wrong place to be, right? Again, it might vary based on subject area, it might vary certainly will vary during this time than it did potentially when your child was in a physical school building. Um, and think about how can you set your goal to get your child to get one more step um, towards independence. One of the things I know about my child is that there is this one app that he does that uh, practices math facts. That one specifically is his most frustrating part of the day. And so one of the things I've been working with him on is really setting goals for that specific part of the day that's been a struggle for him. So just thinking about that as you think about your child, where you are on the continuum, and how you could set goals so that you can get yourself away from kind of being the coach, being there every moment, and getting more towards being that consultant. So also I want to talk about math, right? So I gave you some general tips about really homework, setting up um, kind of scholar independence and thinking about work habits. But why is math different, right? I said at the beginning, every other subject looks pretty much familiar to when we learned in school. Math looks very different. Uh, so one of the things that I think is a good thing is that math has evolved, math uh, teaching and learning has evolved because there's been new research, right? In the past, you know, 20 some odd years, there has been new research that talks about how children learn. Um, and what we recognize is that children don't learn by learning tricks and um, um, tricks and tools. Um, and so one of the things that we recognize is that many people today, in fact, a lot of you at the beginning of this webinar mentioned that math is a frustrating time for you. Um, if you ask a group of people, and I've done this many times before, who here is a math person, most of the um, population doesn't say me, right? The majority of the population feels stronger about uh, reading, feels stronger about writing, feels stronger about science. Math tends to be not uh, the subject area that was the favorite. And that is largely because I believe that math wasn't taught necessarily in the best way when we were younger. Um, and so the new curriculum, the Common Core that we see today, is really about teaching kids in a new way, so that in 20 years from now, when we ask that question, we do see more people who are math people. Um, but then the other thing that's also different is that there's been a shift in goals. So when we were young, math was really about learning how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Um, and if you could do all those, those things, and certainly more as you get older, you were a good mathematician. Um, and what we're learning today, if you can see on this slide, this, these are from the Common Core, right, something that you 
maybe have feelings about. Um, but this is one of our goals of math, that we want our children to be able to make sense of problems and persevere in solving them. Another goal of math instruction is that we want to be able to critique arguments, I'm sorry, construct arguments and critique the reasoning of others. So given that our goals of math instruction is shifting, certainly our math instruction, the way we teach, also has to shift. So some really high level things, um, and I'm not going into too much detail. Here are some really practical tools that I know you want in order to help your child, right? So unfortunately, the reality is the way that we learn math is the different than the way our children are learning math. The good news is by the time our children have children, we won't have this problem anymore. Um, but with that said, I've come up, oh, I'm sorry, actually a consultant of ours has come up with great questions um, that we wanted to share with you that our teachers use in our schools that I use with my children when I'm working with them. Um, and these are some questions that you should be able to use with your children when you are doing math homework. Um, these questions are not magic questions. Um, these questions are really developed in order to encourage students to think. Um, you'll notice that all of these questions are general questions. We call them open-ended questions, right? So all of these questions can be used uh, in response to any mathematics problem that you're doing, no matter if your child's in kindergarten all the way up to high school and beyond. Um, and so these questions really have wide applicability. Um, and today we're going to get a chance to practice using these questions. And again, the goal of these questions is to really get our scholars, our students, our children to do the thinking. So with that said, we're going to practice. We're going to practice using these questions. Um, with a couple of problems that might be familiar to you if you have a child in elementary school. So, with that, um, a couple of thoughts. First, I'm going to share a couple of problems. I would love for you to take a moment to solve that problem on your own. Um, you can use a calculator if you wish. You can use a paper and pencil if you have one. You could use any tool that you have in front of you. If you have your child nearby, certainly feel free to use them to help you. Um, it's really not about the right answer. What we're going to do is after you've had a moment to solve, I'm going to share my solution. And I've asked my colleague Becky, who you've seen in the chat, um, to kind of be the parent. And she's going to use those six questions to see if she can get at my thinking. You're here to practice, right? And certainly, um, given that we are on a webinar, what I would like for you to do is in that chat box that I know you're already using, go ahead and when you are, well, while I'm sharing my uh, solution, I would love for you to chat in which of those six questions or another similar question that you would ask if I was your child. Um, again, it's not about the math. Right? You'll see you can ask any of these six questions without really knowing the answer to the question or without knowing how your child solved. But you're going to learn a lot by answering these, um, sorry, by asking these six questions. And that's really the goal, right? The goal is to get your child to be able to explain their thinking, to be able to explain their argument, and then you're going to really be able to critique that argument. Does that argument make sense? Are you convinced? Are we ready? Um, again, we're going to do a couple because the more you do this, the better you get. Um, I've been doing this for many years, first as a math teacher, as a principal, and now as a parent. Um, and the more that I do it, the better I get at it. So let's get a chance to practice. Are we ready? Okay, first problem. This is a pretty much first grade problem. Obviously, every school curriculum is a little bit different, but we would use this problem in probably first grade. So. I have read 72 books. I need to read 300 to win the contest. How many more books do I need to read? Go ahead and take a minute to solve.
Okay, so hopefully you have a solution. If not, um, go ahead. Again, I want you to use that chat box. Yes, I see a lot of people have figured out the answer is 228, that's fantastic. What I want you to do is actually think about when I solve it, um, go ahead and see if you can use those six questions. How do you know? Convince me, explain that please, prove it, draw a picture and why to see if you can get at my thinking. So already I see it. Um, tempting, right? Tempting to want to show your child this strategy, right? This is probably the way a lot of you solved it if you didn't use a calculator. Um, but I'm going to urge you not to impose the way that you think on your child. And we're really going to use these questions to follow their lead. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead into teacher mode, uh, into student mode, and I'm just going to go back to the question um, to make sure that we're familiar. So I've read 72 books. I want to read 300 to win the contest. How many more books do I need to read? Okay, Becky, are you ready? I think I'm ready. Okay. Hey, Mom, I'm all done. Here's my work today. Okay, so I see your, what's your answer here? Uh, my answer is 228 books. Hey, how do you know? Uh, I know because I already read 72 and I needed to get to 300. And so um, it took 228 books to get to 300. Can you, can you prove that? Yeah. Um, so you can see in my work that I started at 72 because I already read those. Um, and then I jumped up 100 to get to 172, realized that that wasn't enough. I still needed to read more. Um, so I did 100 more, which got me to 272, but I still need to get to 300. I can't do another 100 jump because that's gonna get me too far. So I tried a 20 jump and that got me to 292. And then I jumped eight more and that got me to 300. Um, and then I, know that, again, 72 and 300 were in the problem. What I needed to figure out was how many jumps it took me to get to 300. So I added 100, 100, 20, and 8, and that's my 228. All right. I think I'm convinced. Great. Okay. And I see a couple of you had those questions. How do you know? Uh, Felicia wants to ask, explain that strategy. That's a great question. It's a little um variation on one of ours and it's perfect so that's uh great there um i wanted to just share a couple other strategies that a child might do um again every child is different we really want to follow their lead um so you might see something like this as you can see it's a similar strategy um again same questions apply let's try another one take a moment there are six boys and five girls at a picnic. If each boy gets one fourth of a sandwich and each girl gets two fourths of a sandwich, how many sandwiches will they eat all together? And I know this is the dreaded fractions. Um, so take a moment, think about it, try to solve. Okay, um, so I think a lot of you started to solve it. Um, oh. If you've already solved it, good, hold your answer. We're going to do the same thing that we did before. Becky is going to be my uh, parent and I'm going to get a chance to share my solution. Um, and I want you to be thinking about if I was your child, um, what kind of questions would you ask me? And feel free to add in the chat the questions that you would use. Again, a lot of these questions could work. Um, for those of you asking what grade, again, every curriculum is a little bit different school by school. Um, so uh, this could be a 
somewhere between second and third grade question, most likely. Um, but again, it varies a little bit. Okay, so I see a lot of answers in there. What I want you to focus on is asking me questions. So mom, I'm ready, solve my problem. Okay, so what's your answer here? 11 sandwiches. Okay, can you, uh, can you convince me that that's the right answer? Great, so I'm gonna pause for a moment and just shout out, uh, point out here that one of the most common reasons our children get answers wrong is not because they don't understand the mathematics, it's because they're answering a question that wasn't asked. Um, and so you can see here that I was kind of using the information in the problem and answering a different question. Um, and so again, I just wanted you to think about a lot of times when children get the wrong answer, Sometimes it's because they make a silly precision error, uh, or sometimes it's because they're actually answering a different question. So Becky's question that she just asked is really great because it will help me kind of unpack that. So Becky, can you say that question again? So can you convince me that 11 sandwiches is the right answer here? Sure. Um, so in the story, if you remember, there were six boys and there were five girls um, at the picnic. And so therefore there's, oh, there's 11 children not 11 sandwiches. I think I made a mistake here. So let me see if I can figure this out. Um, okay, so 11 children all together, but now I know that there's more information in the story I need to think about. So obviously there was some pause here and I'm going to come back with this. Mom, I'm done now, I got the right answer. So oh, you drew a picture here? Yeah, oh yes, um, I drew a picture. Thanks for asking me to do that. Um, so there's my answer, four sandwiches. Okay, so why is it four sandwiches? Right, so again, pausing for a moment, this picture looks crazy. A lot of the time our children look crazy, um, but let's see if I can help you make sense of that. Um, okay, so mom, um, so you can see on the top are my six uh, boys, and on the bottom are my five girls. And then I drew sandwiches, and I cut each sandwich into fourths, right? Because I know that each, um, in, in the story, the sandwiches are cut into fourths. So I did the same in my picture. And so you can see that first boy, um, he, let's see if I can get my mouse, he um, ate this piece of sandwich, that's his one-fourth. And this boy ate this piece, and this boy ate this piece, and so on and so on. And then the girls was a little harder because they got two fourths. And so you can see each of the lines from the girls goes to these two lines. And at the end, I had this one girl left over, but luckily I didn't use these two pieces of the sandwich. So I was able to take that girl and put that there. So you can see that every single piece of the sandwich that's up there was used. And I have one sandwich, two sandwiches, three sandwiches, four sandwiches. All right, nice job. Thanks. Um, so again, I see a lot of you using words, prove it, how do you know, how did you get to the answer? All of those questions are really going to help um, help their children think. And I even saw um, someone here said they saw their own mistake, which is great, right? A lot of times when we hear one another's thinking, we start to think about the problem a little bit differently. Okay. So again, your child might not be drawing pictures anymore. Um, and I saw this kind of question come up in the chat. We'll go back to it in the Q&A. But the goal here is that children will over time evolve to more sophisticated strategies. But we want them to go to those sophisticated strategies when those strategies make sense. So typically with fractions at the very beginning, children want to kind of use the numbers, but those numbers don't make much sense to them. So we really encourage our children to go back to the pictures both in early elementary school, but then also when we're learning new um, new content in older grades. So fractions is a great time. We're going, going back to the picture really helps. In middle school, when we get to decimals, that's a really great time to go back to a picture to really visualize what is that decimal representing. Um, so you can see here, not every child's gonna use a picture. Here's another solution a child might have, right? Where these are the boys, these are the girls, and they get their answer in a different way. 
Um, again, another solution where the child is showing six boys who get a quarter, they're setting up the information that's given in the problem, and then they know six times one-fourth is six-fourths, and they get the solution here. So again, it's not here to talk about every single solution. I can't show every solution a child might try, but again, the fact that you can make sense or you can help understand what your child was doing by asking them these questions. Okay, let's try another, we're getting good at this. Okay, so really straightforward, basic math, 45 times 16. This is probably a third or fourth grade problem. Again, every curriculum's a little bit different, so it might be in a different grades depending on what curriculum your school uses, um, but try it out, 45 times 16. Okay, so who is tempted, who solved this way and is tempted to just teach their child this way? Um, again, um, someone made this comment, I think it's really good, right? Our ways are more efficient. Yes, we are adults, our ways are more efficient. At some point, your child will learn this way, right? Every school is a little bit different, but they will learn kind of what you see up here, which is called the standard algorithm at some point. What we want to do as educators is to first make sure your child understands what's happening in the problem before we teach them a kind of shortcut or a trick to help solve it. Um, and I, I saw a comment from Robin who said that it's interesting that the strategy is a lot of times what we do in our head. And that is very true, right? A lot of the math that we're asking our children to do is the math that we likely do when we're at the supermarket, when we don't necessarily need a perfectly correct, um, accurate answer, a precise answer, but a ballpark estimate will work. Um, children can get the, the um, accurate answer by doing these strategies, but a lot of times it's the strategies that we would do in our head anyway. Uh, and that's what we really want. We want our children to be able to think flexibly about numbers. Um, so a lot of you got the answer was 720, but let's show how um, our children might solve it, right? They're probably not gonna solve it this way in early elementary school. So how might they solve? Becky, I'm ready. My work is done, mom. I'm ready to go play on my iPad. Uh, can you explain that, please? <laughs> sure, I can explain that. Um, so the, the question was 45 times 16. Right, and so I don't really know 45 times 16, so I wanted to break it up into numbers that I can figure out on my own. So I broke up 45 into 40 and five, and I broke up a 10 and six, uh, sorry, 16 into a 10 and a six. And then I know that if I just multiply all those parts, then I can get my answer. So 40 times 10, that's really easy for me, that's 400. 10 times five is really easy, it's 50. 40 times six, 240, five times six is 30. And then I take kind of all those pieces and I add them together, where you can see I did it on the right-hand side, and 640 and 80 equals my 720. Great, go play on your iPad. <laughs> Woohoo! Okay, um, again, not, uh, sorry. So this is called an array. You've probably seen your children do it. It's a really nice strategy. It's essentially very similar to what we're doing in the previous strategy, but we want our children to understand. Um, often children will do a strategy like this and forget that they kind of have to do all of the pieces, and we want them to see um, why this really works. And using the array model is a, a very good one for them to visualize it. And you'll see that a lot, right? A lot of the strategies that we're using in the new map is really giving kids a kind of visual image of what they're thinking in their head, um, which helps really uh, deepen the understanding. Um, I just want to comment, again, I know we're directed here mostly at elementary school, but these questions work um, in middle school as well, right, and high school as well. So it's not about the mathematics that you're doing, but all of these questions can work uh, or absolutely 100% work. In fact, they even work better the less we know about the math, right? Because the less that we know about the math, the more we really have to attend to what our child is saying and really follow what they're saying. Um, and when their kind of explanation doesn't make complete sense, 
we'll have to ask them to kind of clarify or to add more. So just to kind of show you that a child might do this in middle school, and um, we're not going to kind of try this one out, but you could see that the same strategy that they learned in elementary school will apply when they get to more difficult math. And I just showed two different ways that the child could solve it. One is using the exact same way that we just used to solve, and then recognizing that um, 16 hundredths in order to get to six, it's not 16, it's 16 hundredths. In order to get there, I have to divide by 100. Um, and so that is how I get to my answer, 7.2. Okay, so just to sum all this up, I've spoken a lot. We're about to go into the question and answer, and I hope you've got some questions there. Um, I think I see some coming across the screen already. If not, go ahead and put them in there. I want to make sure we get to as many as possible. Um, but a couple of things. One, be positive, right? Math has got to be fun, right? Reading is fun, right? Our goal here is to de develop our child's joy of learning. Um, and if we are kind of being negative about math, if we're talking negatively about math or we're disparaging our own ability to do math, our children are going to pick up on that. And so one of the things I would encourage you to do is check yourself if this is what you're noticing that you're doing. See how you can commit to changing that and start becoming a math person. Um, my third grade math teacher used to always say to us, I love math and math loves me. Maybe you need to say that every morning. Um, emphasize effort, right? The goal here is not about forcing our children to get to the right answer. Um, I know that if I sit down with almost any child, um, I could get them to get the right answer if I ask them very specific questions or tell them what they should do next. That's not going to translate into my child being able to do this stuff independently, right? It's also not going to translate to that feeling that they get when they've actually accomplished something that was really difficult. So I would encourage you to really emphasize your child showing effort and put less pressure on your child getting the right, right answer. When they come to you with a worksheet that is done um, or three problems that they've solved, really look at, see, did it look like they showed effort or did it look like they just kind of solved them as fast as they can to get to on to the next thing in their day um, when they show effort emphasize that and if they don't encourage them to show more effort use those six questions print them out have them in front of you jot them on a screen take a picture on your phone now um, we'll send these out afterwards um, so Six questions, they're there, use them to help you. They work no matter what um, content your child is working on. Um, and then give feedback, right? Tell your child how they're doing, right? One of the things I'm noticing is with the math facts, my child is getting very frustrated. Um, and so I need to tell him and have a conversation with the fact that I'm noticing that and setting goals for him so that he can feel successful moving forward um, around that frustration level. Um, and then ask for help, right? Your teachers are still there for you. They might not physically be right there, um, but now more than ever, your teachers really are relying on you and your child to communicate what they need. They have a much smaller, narrower lens to figure out what is going on with your child. And so the more that you communicate to them, the more that you ask for help or tell them what your child is doing or not doing well, the more that they can help you. Um, and that is a big push for not necessarily trying to force your child to submit perfect work every day. Um, it is worthwhile if your child's really struggling with something to submit the effort filled but imperfect work so that the teacher knows what your child is struggling with and how they can help them. Um, so with that all said, um, let's take some questions. Great, so Stacey, I'll just voice over a few that have been coming through, um, and I think there are some themes that we're seeing. So one question that is coming through is sort of this question about these strategies seem a lot slower than the one that the ones that parents are more familiar with. Why would math evolve in this way when there's a much faster route to getting the right answer? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So they might feel a lot slower right now. And part of the reason that they were slow was because I was taking the time to really explain every single step of what I was doing. Uh, I know that at Success Academies, we do a math fee every year. 
And I promise you that our children um, and, and all children who think this way actually become much more efficient as they become more um, flexible with this. So one of the pieces about the strategy is that, um, at least when I learned, and I'm assuming when you learned as well, when we saw a specific type of problem, we were told this was the strategy that you use. What we're trying to show our students is that when you see a specific problem, you should be looking at both what you need to do to solve, right? Add, multiply, subtract, divide, et cetera, as well as what kind of the numbers tell you, and that should help you pick your strategy, right? And there are some times where the strategy of that standard algorithm, the kind of carrier the one, is most efficient, but there's plenty of times where there's another strategy that is less, uh, that is more efficient, right? There's plenty of times where, um, for instance, a, a big example, a very simple example is 19 times two, right? A child can very quickly, and you probably do this in your head, a lot of people do this, where they do 20 times two is 40, and they subtract two because they wanna get to 19. Um, so again, it really depends on the problem, and one of the things we're trying to teach our kids to do is to look at the numbers and pick the strategy that matches or that best makes sense to them for those numbers. Um, but it will be slower in the short term, um, and the idea is that as children are building this conceptual understanding, um, it's going to be a little bit clunkier. Um, in the long run, though, uh, it is much more efficient is what we see in our children. What about a situation where a child maybe has the right answer but is having difficulty explaining that? You know, a parent is using the prompts and the child is struggling to explain. What should they do that's, then? Yeah, that's a great question um, and certainly is really applicable for our younger elementary school students who are less used to kind of explaining what they're thinking. Um, my advice here is just to keep asking those questions and they might not be able to explain themselves on every single question, but if you keep asking those questions, they're going to get better and better and better at that. Um, you know, to the extent that you can see that your child did something and they're unable to explain that, it's okay to give them the words um, that they might not have. So, oh, um, for instance, that 45 question, if the child kind of broke up the 40 and 5 but doesn't know how to explain that, you can say, oh, it looks like you broke up the 45 into 40 and 5. Is that what you did? Um, so one of the things we tell our teachers is that if a child has done something already on their paper and is just struggling to be able to articulate um, it, you can really just um, coach them a little bit and give them some language that they have in the future. But um, really, the more kids get practice with having to be explain themselves, the better they will get at this. Great. And you mentioned that, you know, Math is not all about getting the right answer. Um, so one parent wanted to know then why are schools giving math tests and including getting the right answer as part of the score? Great question. Um, so a couple of things. One, that's not the only thing kids get uh, credit for. So it depends on the math test you're giving, but definitely at Success Academies, students get credit for the work that they're showing in addition to the answer. Um, and sometimes they can get more credit for the work than they do for the answer. Obviously, every problem's different. It's not that we don't want our children to eventually get the right answer. Certainly, we want our children to eventually get the right answer. But too often, um, you know, educators and, teach and parents alike are so focused on getting the child to the right answer that they're jumping over the learning that needs to happen. And I can, and I've seen this happen where a child kind of is coached to get the right answer every single day, and then they're given a test and they can't do that on their own. So what I'm trying to emphasize is that rather than make every day the focus getting the right answer, really make the focus about that process, that what the child is thinking. If we can really kind of figure out what the child is thinking, and help um, develop that type of thinking, they will get to the right answer. And certainly, you know, by the end of the year, we want them to be able to get there. But um, really focusing all of our energy on the right answer really misses um, the point. 
Great. And Michelle noticed that uh, her child's teachers are often very focused on labeling, even when the answer is right. And sometimes kids get sent back to label their work. Um, and she noticed that the examples here didn't include labeling. Can you speak a little bit to how much that matters or doesn't matter? Yes, yeah, shame on me. Um, I should have had labels um, and I apologize profusely right now. Uh, labeling is really important um, and less important, not, not that it's important, it's a work habit that we want to really establish because as the problems get more complicated, and those of you who have older elementary school and middle school scholars certainly can attest to this, children start to lose track of information. So if you remember that sandwich question, um, if I labeled that six plus five and I labeled six students plus five students or six boys plus five girls, I would have recognized mistake that it didn't equal 11 sandwiches. And so labeling really helps keep track of that information. Certainly as an adult, I am better able to do that and our children will get better at able to keep track of that information as they kind of develop. But um, certainly we want to emphasize those work habits where children are labeling so that it's really clear both to themselves what they did, but also to the reader what they did. And so um, thinking about some of those problems, you might have been able to better understand what I did if I had labeled those. So shame on me, thank you. <laughs> um, Stacey, another parent had a question about um, a bilingual student who really struggles to understand the language in a long problem. Once they get that, they're usually able to do the math, but they're struggling with the, the reading comprehension piece. What would you suggest there? That's a great question. And actually, I would say that that applies to many more than just bilingual kids. That's probably the biggest struggle for elementary school students and middle school and beyond. Um, in math, really getting kids to understand what is the problem asking me. Um, I mean, my son yesterday solved a problem very confidently, um, but he solved a problem that wasn't asked. Um, and so, um, great question. So here's some thoughts. Depending on um, your child, there's a lot of different strategies you can use. One of the strategies we use is acting it out. So you don't have to get elaborate, you don't need props or anything. Um, but for instance, the problem that we had with the books, I might say, let's act it out. Like, let's get those 70, I'm forgetting the numbers, but let's get those 70 some odd books that I read already. Everyone has them. Okay, see that stack? Like, how big is it? Like, have your child pretend to show how big 70 books would be. Oh, okay. But I need to read 300. Well, let's imagine that stack of 300. How big would that be? I don't know if you can see me, but right, it'd be much bigger. Okay, so what am I trying to find out? I'm trying to find out how many books I need to get from this stack to this stack. Um, so really acting it out. Again, you don't need any objects to act it out, but getting your kids to visualize what's happening in the problem is one really good strategy. Um, another is for them to draw a picture, right? So really before your child is tempted to start to solve. I know my child, and I'm sure indicative of other children as well, he is always rushing. He wants to do this work as fast as possible. And I've got to really kind of stop him and say, Jake, what's the question? And what are you trying, before you write, look, what are you trying to solve? And really getting him to stop and take a moment to really think about what is the question asking? And then what information do I know already? So going back to that question with the sandwiches, what is the question asking me? It's asking me how many sandwiches were eat, eaten or ate. Uh, in, um, and then it's, what information do I have? The information is that there were six boys and five girls. And to the point earlier about labeling, if you can get your child to kind of record that information and organize it in a nice way, that will help them for uh, set up for success. So again, my advice is to slow down. Children really want to kind of get to the solution quickly. And we want them to really, what we say, invest in the question. Take a moment to really understand what that question is asking, either by jotting things down. Some children use underlining or circling, um, maybe making a picture or acting it out. And you spoke a little bit about how children will sort of ladder up to more complicated strategies. Is there anything that parents can do to help move their children from, let's say, a picture to a more complex method? 
Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't put so much pressure on getting your kid there. Your child will get there on their own. Um, and what I would encourage you to do first is ask the teacher what their expectation is for their child. So um, teachers have really clear kind of understanding of what type of strategies kids should be using at different grade levels. And there's no rush to kind of get ahead of that. So I would first kind of ask, is this strategy grade level appropriate or should I be, you know, or should my child be at a different strategy? Um, one of the nice things I know a lot of teachers do and have been doing is sending home examples of different ways different students solved. And so one of the things that you might see already in your curriculum or you can ask your teacher to do is send home with you. Um, uh, send home different ways that this problem could be solved and then ask your child to see if they can make sense of it. What did this child do? What do you see in their work? If the, if the work is neat and labeled, your child should be able to make sense. Um, and then asking them to think about how your strategy is similar or different than the strategy that someone else did. Um, that's what we do in school. Obviously, that is um, not necessary, that's kind of going beyond Z, um, but I understand a lot of parents are eager to do that. But again, I would first check with the teacher um, to see if they um, it's appropriate for their child to kind of go beyond what they're currently doing. Great, and there was one specific question around first graders that I know is close to home question for you. Um, parents are wondering how, what their first graders should really know in terms of math. Um, and how important it is that their first graders learn addition facts? Oh, great question. So two things. One, first grade is really a great mathematics year. A lot of uh, first grade is about this understanding of 10 um, and developing what we call the base 10 understanding. But this idea, if you remember the 45, that I can break it up into a 40 and a 5. Um, that's a big understanding that you'll see in first grade. Um, in first grade, we're really getting our kids to be more efficient with their addition and subtraction by thinking about these tens um, and these ones. Um, and first grade is really about, uh, again, really understanding the question. And so you'll see children are being asked all sorts of kind of subtraction questions that look different or addition questions where sometimes you don't know the answer. Sometimes you don't know, you know, you know how many blue apples there were. Blue apples are weird. There's maybe how many green apples there were, but you don't know how many red apples there are. You know how many total apples there are. So really getting kids to really understand what the question is asking. In terms of math facts, math facts are so important, right? One of the things that we see is that if our children get to middle school and or even later elementary school and don't have those math facts, um, do you want to come in? You can sit, but I need to be quiet. Um, my first grader is here. So can you just close the door? The, if they don't have those math facts, it's going to be really hard for them to do um, those more sophisticated strategies later on. One of the things I want you to recognize about math facts is it really shouldn't be about memorization. And so the way we think about teaching math facts is children first are learning the plus ones and the plus zeros. And that's really to develop that understanding that when I'm adding zero, it's not going to change the number. If I'm adding one, it's going to go up one. Then they're doing doubles, right? Four plus four, five plus five, six plus six. Then they're doing these doubles plus one and these doubles minus one. So math facts really should also be learned by not just straight up memorization, but by thinking about what facts do I know and how can I use those facts that I do know in order to kind of figure out a fact that I don't know. Great, and another uh, sort of set of questions on strategies here. So um, Juana is wondering why sometimes her children are asked to do more than one strategy. And then there's this sort of same question about, shouldn't we just teach the most efficient strategy first and then worry about the other stuff? Great question. Um, I'm just jotting those down. Becky, you'll remind me if I forget one of them. So. The first question, the why are there more than one strategy? So this is actually a great answer to an earlier question of how do we get our kids to progress from a less sophisticated strategy to a more sophisticated strategy? Once our children know the answer, they usually are more comfortable trying something out that they're not used to. And so the goal of asking kids to share, uh, to try two different ways is to get them to really progress in that sophistication. So if I did that fraction question and I drew the picture the first time, 
well, maybe the second time I don't need to draw that picture, but I could actually just use those fraction numbers to solve. And it's a little bit easier for me because I still have that picture in front of me. Um, and so I think that goes into the second question, uh, which, Becky, can you just remind me of again? Yeah, why, not? Why, don't, why don't we just learn the efficient ones first? Right. And so if you'll notice, and um, let me see if I can kind of go back to that slide. It might be helpful here. These strategies actually, oh, I'm going forwards. I apologize. Uh, I'll talk as I find it. But these strategies actually build upon them, uh, one another. And so if your child is um, trying, you know, solving this way with a fractions question, you can see, um, if I can get my cursor here, that this is one fourth, and this is one fourth, and this is one fourth, and this is one fourth. And so the child actually, when they start to do this, they have the connection in their brain to this picture, right? And so that these numbers that you're seeing here, that honestly, when we learned fractions, were really a set of numbers that didn't really have much meaning. Um, actually is attached to this visual picture. Um, and then when we get to this strategy, which is a more sophisticated strategy, the child is really able to connect back to that understanding of what six-fourths really is, right? If you ask a lot of adults what six-fourths are, you know, they can probably tell you it's one and a half, or they can probably tell you it's more than one. Um, but this understanding that six-fourths is really six one-fourths, it's a big understanding that a lot of um, kids in, in later elementary school and middle school don't have, and certainly a lot of adults don't have. And so the, the concern about jumping to the more sophisticated strategy is that children don't actually understand it. Certainly they can do it. Kids are really good at parroting back answers. Um, and so they will certainly be able to do what you teach them. But again, going back to this reflection that many adults don't feel confident about math, right? If you ask many adults, they tell you that math was a waste of their time. They don't remember kind of what you're supposed to do, why you're supposed to do. Is this the one where you keep change flip or is this the one where you cross multiply? What do you do here? Um, and the goal here is to really make sure that kids understand why keep change flip works so that when they forget if they're supposed to keep change flip or kind of cross multiply, they will um, able to be able to figure that out. Great, and our last question here um, is, how can parents go about gaining a more, more of a conceptual understanding of math? Um, and would that be helpful in sort of empowering them to support their children? A hundred percent. I, you know, it depends on how much time you have. I certainly have learned a lot as uh, well as an educator, and I know your child's teachers learn a lot. Um, I think the best way to actually learn is actually from your kids. Um, your kids are going through this math, um, and really, if you can understand what it is they're doing, you'll learn the conceptual math. Um, other than that, um, you can certainly uh, I'm sure there's a million websites that kind of go on there. Um, I'm sure on Twitter you can kind of follow people, but I think the best way to really learn conceptual math is by doing math. So um, don't be afraid when your child's doing math homework. If you have an extra moment, go ahead and try out some problems. Um, if you um, and try to um, not do it the way that you um, traditionally do it. So or um, following our guidance. Do it the way you traditionally do it, but then see if you can solve it another way. Yeah, but definitely the best way to kind of learn conceptual math is by doing conceptual math. And so I'd encourage you to pick up a paper and pencil and follow along with your kid and see if you're uh, thinking you can develop. Great. I think that will do it on our uh, Q&A. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, again, I know that this is a challenging time for everyone, and I appreciate you so much being here. I definitely believe that being here is an indicator that whatever you're doing is already um, enough, uh, but hopefully you learned a couple of tips here. Um, I wanna see kind of how it's going. We wanna hear from you. So if you're not currently following us on social media, please do, and if you are, please post and share how it's going. We wanna see pictures of you being math people. We wanna see pictures of math joy in your um, house. So thank you um, and have a great day.